Hello guys, Oscar Hotel 8, Sierra Tango November here from Survival Tech Nord. Welcome to the first episode of How to Solar Power Your Portable Radio. This series is going to help you put together your own solar power system, including solar panels, battery systems, charge controllers, along with all the knowledge and expertise required to sustainably power almost any portable radio station off-grid and in the field. If you stick with me, I'll teach you what I know. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems. This station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign area. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what type of radio we're talking about. Amateur radio, CB radio... FRS, PMR, or GMRS radios. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a pocket-sized QRP radio designed for a SOTA summit, or the VHF UHF base camp radio providing communications at the base of Mount Everest. Whatever type of portable radio equipment you want to power in the field, we can get it done with solar power. This will be true as long as we're not operating in total darkness. We'll go through all the components of a solar power system shortly, but first, let's take a look at our deployment objectives for our solar power system. Our solar power and battery storage systems need to be light enough and pack small enough that we can take them man portable to the field. If the system is more than a couple of pounds or kilograms, it's a no-go. Because of this, we try to place some practical limits on the maximum size and weight of our solar power systems. The reason for this is mobility. We must always assume we have a finite amount of space, a finite amount of load capacity, and that we very well may end up operating on foot, man portable, in the field. Now, our portable radios and solar power systems work hand in hand with one another. Knowing we're going to be operating primarily from solar power, let's take a look at some of the prerequisites helping us to choose the most off-grid friendly portable radios. The two most important factors for off-grid portable radio and solar power are receive current consumption and transmit efficiency. The size, weight, and capacity of our battery systems in the field are directly related to the current consumption requirements of our radios. Simply put, the more current our radio consumes while it's just sitting there receiving, the bigger the battery we need to keep it powered up for long periods of time. The opposite is also true. The more efficient or lower current consumption our radio consumes, the longer we can operate with a ridiculously small battery pack. Our radio's transmit efficiency and current consumption also have a direct impact on the size of the solar panels we choose for the field. Using a high current radio in the field means we also need larger, more capable solar panels to reach that plus minus zero consumption point for sustainable field communications. The main takeaway here is finding a radio which meets all of your other requirements for data, for voice, for CW, whatever, as well as having ridiculously low current consumption. If this concept is still too abstract, let's put it in more pragmatic terms. The lower you can get your current consumption from your radio, from your computer, from whatever devices you're connecting to your solar power system, the more money we can save on our solar power and battery storage systems. For example, it takes a much more capable solar power and battery storage system to field a Yaesu FT891 than it does a Zygu G90. This is because the Yaesu FT891 has higher current consumption and a higher energy overhead, increasing current consumption on both transmit and receive, even though both of them would be set up to transmit 20 watts, which is the maximum transmit power of the G90. Now, it's also true that the G90, where it is more efficient than an Yaesu FT891, the ICOM IC705 is much more efficient than the G90. The IC705, operating at less than half the current consumption of the G90 on receive, allows us to use smaller capacity batteries and smaller solar panels versus a G90 deployment. 
Now, the ultimate in off-grid friendly radios is, of course, the LAP 599TX500. Its transmit efficiency is on par with the ICOM IC705, but its receive current is the best we've seen so far from a commercial HF radio. This leaves the Yellowcraft KX2 and KX3 someplace between the TX500 and IC705 in regards to efficiency and receive current. Trust me on this, the only way to reduce our battery capacity and the weight of our solar panels is by reducing current consumption. And now let's go ahead and take a look at the breakdown of the solar power system. Regardless of size, complexity, or the amount of power we require to operate our gear in the field, our solar power systems have roughly the same components regardless. The first is the battery pack. Generally on this channel, if I've built this battery pack myself, the battery chemistry is going to be lithium iron phosphate or LIFEPO4. Now these packs are a little bit different than the pack on your motorcycle or in your car. They're made up of individual cells stuck together, wired together in series and parallel to reach the desired capacity for the pack. Never mind if you don't understand that just yet, I'll leave a link in the description for previous battery packs we built on the channel, and we'll also be doing a high-speed low-drag battery pack for ham radio expeditions like Parks on the Air, Summits on the Air, or any ham radio expedition where portability is critical. The next component in our solar power system is the charge controller. Ironically, the charge controller is probably the most important part of any portable solar power system. Skimping on the charge controller is almost guaranteed to have a negative effect on the rest of our portable solar power system. My preferred brand is Guinnesson. It's American made, American designed, completely RF quiet, and has proven performance in some of the toughest yacht races around the world. Now this video focuses on lithium iron phosphate battery packs, but Guinnesson also supports other battery chemistries, for example, lithium ion. For LIFEPO4 or lithium iron phosphate chemistries, these are the most interesting models. The Guinnesson GV5 is a 4S MPPT lithium iron phosphate charge controller. Now the GV5 is an excellent choice for QRP radios or low power radios, not drawing more than 5 amps, or solar panels, which aren't producing more than 65 watts. The GV5 has a load port which can control a relay for higher current, or your QRP radio can also be connected directly to that load port. Next we have the Genesan GV5 mod. The GV5 is one I use when I'm integrating a charge controller into a battery pack or smaller solar generator. It has all of the features and functionality of a full-size, full-featured Guinnesson controller, but is delivered bare bones with the expectation that it's going to be integrated into a larger project. And Guinnesson has two more charge controllers which are relevant to this series. The first is the GV10 Lithium, while the second is the Guinnesson GVB8 Boost controller. Both of these charge controllers are meant for 4S lithium iron phosphate battery packs with both providing the excellent performance we expect from Guinnesson charge controllers. Now the GV10 is the type of charge controller I would use if I were living in Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Costa Rica, Southern Italy, and other places like that. Now the GV8 has a boost functionality which is good for locations which have a lot of overcast, a lot of clouds, or for higher latitudes where the days are shorter, the sun doesn't come up that high above the horizon, or there's a lot of clouds or overcast. The Guinnesson charge controllers are designed to do one thing extremely well, which is making the most out of the solar harvesting using the panel that you have. Guinnesson charge controllers are extremely efficient, use very little power, and won't introduce any interference in your sensitive radio equipment. Now there is another solar charge controller which we've seen on my channel, and that's the Buddy Pole Power Mini. 
Now, the benefit of the Buddy Pole Power Mini and Power Mini Plus is integrated power distribution, integrated current and voltage meters, and it supports multiple battery chemistries. The downside is the poor performance compared to the Guinnessod during low light or overcast conditions. It also suffers from poor charging profiles for lithium ion and lithium iron phosphate battery chemistries. Hopefully we can see a dedicated constant current constant voltage charge controller for lithium iron phosphate batteries from Buddy Pole in the future, although I'm not holding my breath. Now the third and final part of the system breakdown, of course, is solar panels. Now although Powerfilm is supporting this series, it's also important to point out some of the panels we've seen on the channel previously and to let you know that it's okay to buy whatever solar panel you want to as long as it fits your requirements and your budget. When I began this journey, I started off with a Harbor Freight Solar Briefcase. Now, it was definitely too heavy for hiking, but it did provide sufficient power for a Yaesu FT817. That's what I was using at the time. Now, if there was even a hint of a cloud in the sky, I wouldn't be able to charge anything with this solar panel. For that reason, I consider it a fail. After this, it didn't take long to move over to the Goal Zero Nomad series. Now, the Nomad series was definitely more portable than the Harbor Freight Folding Suitcase, and it had better performance. Now, it would be fair to say I was happy with the Goal Zero Nomad series while they lasted. The problem was they just couldn't stand being thrown in a backpack with lots of other gear and stand up to the rigors of being multiple days or weeks out in the field. Now, I don't really consider the Gold Zero Nomad series a fail, but because of the reliability issues, it's probably better suited for car camping or some activities like that. Now, after experiencing the failures from the Gold Zero Nomad series, my wife said, with all the money we're wasting replacing these broken panels, can't you buy something more robust? And sitting there, astonished and confused, I thought to myself, who the heck are you and what have you done with my wife? Now, I had learned the name Powerfilm Solar when I was in the Marine Corps, so it was only a matter of finding out if the company still existed and saving up some money. I ended up buying a 20-watt amorphous silicon flexible solar panel from Powerfilm. It's lightweight, flexible, packs up small, and is hardly noticed in a backpack once it's stowed away, which was perfect for the 817. I still have the 20 watt panel from Powerfilm, and in fact, I bought a second one, but it wasn't until I bought the Yaesu FT891, which turned out to be an extremely current hungry radio with terrible efficiency. That's when I pulled the trigger on the 120 watt Powerfilm, but let's leave the QRO operations to another episode. Now, regardless of what brand of solar panel you're going to buy, it's still difficult to figure out the individual components to power our stations. Now, in this part of the video, we're going to talk about our solar go kits, how to determine what we need and what goes in it. For this example, we're talking about operating MAM portable, most likely QRP, but not necessarily. Now, if you're just getting started in solar powered field communications, you're in good shape. I like to consider rigs as being either off-grid friendly or not. Of course, some of them are more off-grid friendly than the others. What I like to recommend to my viewers and followers is a radio which has received current consumption of 300 milliamps or less. For radios like the ICOM IC705 or the TX500 from Lab 599 operating at 10 watts using a 3 amps, or less on transmit. Of course, if you're not planning on using an external battery, an internal battery which can be simultaneously charged while you're using the radio. Next, a radio which isn't very particular about the voltage used to power it. Wide voltage input, it's very important. So now you have all of these key features. There's five of them which I consider off-grid friendly. Now you can create a list of potential radios you'd like to use in the field. Then give the radio one star for each of these off-grid friendly points the radio achieves. This helps us narrow down the field 
giving us an objective look at which radios are off-grid friendly or not. So you did your research, you've got your radio, and now you're thinking about your solar panel and your battery. Now to be completely honest, I've redone this part of the video at least 10 times, and I've come to the conclusion that a technical explanation of how to do this is too abstract. So the best advice I can actually give you, the most pragmatic advice I can give you for choosing your battery and your solar panel is by taking a practical measurement of your actual current consumption while you're using the radio. What we want from this measurement is current consumption measured over a span of time. The current consumption with the radio set up in the way you like to listen to it. Likewise, we want to measure the amount of current the radio is using while operating modes like FT8, SSB, CW, JS8 call, a Winlink session, and so on, all over a span of time. What you're looking at on the right side of the screen is this measurement process actually taking place. I'm actually measuring a Winlink session using the ICOM IC705, the PA500 amplifier, which was the question mark, and my Microsoft Surface Go 2. Now, don't be fooled by the dual solar panels there. There was a second station operating from that tent with me. So the bottom line, I was able to figure out how much current consumption my radio was using, how much I was using when I was transmitting in a practical wind link session, and of course, determining if the added weight of the amplifier and its performance benefit could be reconciled with a single lightweight flexible panel. Now, taking the time to do those measurements wasn't a waste. I was able to determine how much current consumption my radio, my amplifier, and my tablet used during a typical gray sky wind link session as I normally do. So my solar go kit recommendation for radios like the ICOM IC705 or the Lab 599TX500 is a 30 or 60 watt power film solar panel a 5 or 10 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery, and a Genison GVB8 lithium boost controller. If you're strictly QRP, stick with the 5 amp hour and 30 watt panel. If you're like me and you also like to utilize the amplifier from time to time, I would suggest a 5 or 10 amp hour battery and the 60 watt power film panel. Ultimately, it's a lot like putting Lego blocks together. The only thing you have to do is do your research. All right, guys, if you've made it this far in the video, I have a little bit of a surprise for you. If you're one of my channel supporters, that means YouTube members or you've sent a super chat, Patreon members, or you've sent over a root beer with the PayPal support link. Powerfilm is giving away two panels as the kickoff to this video. One will go to North America, and the other will go someplace else in the world. For the rest of you who might like to support this series, Kick Aparts is giving a 5% discount to those of you who do so. Alright guys, look, these videos are incredibly time consuming to make, but I think they'll become a valuable resource for the community. Please let me know what you thought about this first episode of How to Solar Power Your Portable Ham Radio. And uh, you might also leave me a comment with some of your ideas for upcoming episodes. Alright guys, if you like what I'm doing, if you like the content I'm creating, please leave me a comment and or a thumbs up to let me know. And if it's not too much to ask, please share this video with someone or somewhere where other operators might enjoy it. Rock and roll guys, thanks for watching. Ciao.